Each year, the Motor Performance Car of the Year gathers together all of the hottest hardware that launched in the previous 12 months, and then in a series of track and road testing, we decide which was the greatest. The problem is though, cars like this $370,000 Porsche 911 GT3 aren't perhaps best described as accessible. That's why, for this year, we've introduced a new category that focuses on the more affordable end of the performance market. This is the sports car of the year. At the smallest end of our fleet, we've got a couple of compact hatchbacks, but what this pair lack in size, they more than make up for in punch. Both powered by 1.6 litre turbocharged petrol engines, the Hyundai i20N, that has a four cylinder with 150 kilowatts, it has to send its power to the road through just two front wheels. The Toyota GR Yaris Rally, however, that has a 1.6 litre three cylinder and 200 kilowatts, and it also has all wheel drive. How will this pair of WRC inspired road cars go on the track and the road? We're gonna find out. High performance doesn't necessarily need to equal impractical, as these three cars nicely demonstrate. Skoda's Octavia RS wagon, Golf GTI power at the front, 640 litre boot at the back. And what about these two? Hyundai's i30 N sedan and the Ford Focus ST hatchback. Both cars can accommodate five adults comfortably, but both have big boots. And thanks to big turbocharged petrol engines at the front, both cars produce 206 kilowatts of power. These are the cars that could quite happily look after daily duties in the week, but you can still enjoy on the weekend. And what about this for a duel? No sports car of the year would be complete without the iconic Volkswagen Golf GTI, but it goes up against a relatively new rival, the BMW 128Ti. Front wheel drive BMW, how do you feel about that? Either way, this car is trying to cut that car's grass. On paper, both seem very closely matched. Identical power of 180 kilowatts from a two litre turbo four cylinder, almost identical torque, almost identical weight. This is gonna be a battle within a battle. But I know what you're thinking. For this to be a true sports car comparison, we need something real drive, front engine and manual. We've got you covered too. Subaru's BRZ returning in its second generation, this time with a bigger, more powerful and torquey boxer engine. The most power you can have under the bonnet of a naturally aspirated Ford Mustang, the Mark I, 345 kilowatts from its Coyote V8. And I know it's been around a little while, but Mazda's MX-5 is still punching hard. And this is the RS, which means it's the most track focused version of all. And it's also about the lightest car we've got here. Those are our 10 contenders. Let's get stuck in. Crowning a winner is only possible after a thorough week-long process involving assessments on both public roads as well as private testing facilities. The judges develop a picture of each car using a combination of data-driven tests as well as more subjective analysis. It's important to note that the cars are not being compared to each other, but with their rivals in the broader automotive landscape and against their market proposition. Performance, dynamics, accessibility, livability and X-factor are all under the microscope. But as this is the sports car of the year, value is particularly important. And it all starts with the road loops. Unless you have access to your own private racetrack, this is where a majority of high performance cars will spend their lives. Here, the judges are looking for how the various models handling, road holding and performance is applied to typical Australian drivers' roads. And how the manufacturer's promises translate into the real world. The sports cars went up a road out of Conway and that was instantly very twisty, very bumpy, and it was a real test for the car. There are plenty of different factors that we're looking at when we're assessing these cars. We're looking at how the steering feels, how it weights up through corners, how much communication we're getting through the front tires, the power that the car makes, where it makes that power. We're trying to look at the car as a cohesive unit and how it behaves on road in these typical conditions. What we're looking for is how the car responds to all the lumps and bumps in the road. We try and look for different cambers, get the car unsettled. You have to be able to drive that car to the supermarket or with the kids to school, but also have some fun on the weekend or on the way home from work. We take it upon ourselves to test the car in the scenario where these cars will probably spend most of their time. There's no point in having a car that's great on track and terrible on road.
The most surprising car for me is the Volkswagen Golf GTI. And largely because for some reason, there's been a slightly muted press for that car. Some people have been a little bit sniffy about it and said, this isn't a vintage generation of Golf GTI. But for me, that car manages its compromises really smartly. And that's something that a great hot hatch does. And the Golf GTI is just a car that I got out of and just went, wow, that's something quite special. The weight of expectation sits very heavy on the shoulders of the Golf GTI. This is a car with a lot of heritage, a lot of history, and everyone has their own thoughts about what it should be to them. In my opinion, I think it does nail the age-old GTI brief. You know, if you think about what the GTI always has been, it's been almost a sleeper car. It's a practical, pragmatic hatchback that you can use Monday to Friday, and on the weekends, and you want to go stretch the legs, it'll do it, and it'll do it to a really high degree. The Subaru BRZ performed fantastically on road. It's super engaging, it thrills you, and it seems to have fixed all the issues we had previously found with the last generation car. It seems like a small tweak that they've done and everyone's just talking about the engine, but just the culmination of the little tweaks they've done to that car to make it better. Even down to the fact the interior has been vastly improved in terms of quality and ease of use. It was just phenomenal on that road. The great thing about the new BRZ is that Subaru have listened. They've just sat back, listened to what people have said about the old car and fixed it. It really has been a case of uh, evolution rather than uh, revolution. It's that fun driver's car that keeps you feeling connected with it. it. It's so much fun through the tight and twisty corners. It's that car you get out and you want to keep driving. It retains all of that same magic and everything we loved about the originals, but elevates it in virtually every area. That car is absolutely alive with the spirit of driving and performance. It has improved in any area that we could previously have said it needed improving in. And that is a very smart decision by Subaru and a well thought out result. The sports cars, what an awesome bunch of cars. I mean, I-20 in, I-30 in, if you had told me that I'd be driving and loving Hyundai's on a twisty road five or 10 years ago, I would have laughed at you. But these two cars, wow, we're just so well resolved, so well sorted. <laughs> it's interesting with both of the N cars we have, especially the i20N, it, it looks like it would be the unruly child of the group because it's got all the wings and the wheels and the red striping and stuff like that. But it's actually very mature in the way that it handles on road. Look, this car really probably lives up to the to the mark of being a hot little hatch. It's the right size, it's the right dynamics, it does everything you want. It gives you that feeling of that it wants to be driven hard. As a driver, it gives you all the right feedback through the front end, through the braking and everything. That engine pulls well, the manual gearbox is a great accompaniment. But for me, it was just slightly overshadowed by another Hyundai, the i30N sedan, which just made me laugh out loud every time I drove it. The i30 sedan N though, it's, I don't know how it passes laws because it is so loud. I burst out laughing the first time I heard the pops and bangs in that car. It's by far louder than any of the other N cars that they currently have. I'm a big fan of the i30 N sedan. I think as a car to buy out of the family, the N is a really compelling package. Right around 50 grand, its performance capabilities are best in class. At the same time, it's also the comfiest out of all the N cars. It's got the biggest boot, it can carry five people with relative comfort. I think it's just a really intelligently designed car. From driving the rally on road, this is the GR Yaris that Australia always deserved. It does everything that the previous car had promised to do, but failed to deliver. The engine is mega for a three cylinder. It's got so much grunt and so much torque. I imagine that if we did sports car of the year on gravel roads, that would win the competition by a mile. You know, that's what it feels like to me. And huge kudos to Toyota for bringing a car like that to the market because it's just like, you know, completely different to everything else. It's such a fun car. You can definitely feel that motorsport inspired dynamics about it. There's so much that it does right. It gives so much feedback. It's, it's very raw in so many ways and it really is a true driver's car. 
This year we've had a really strong field and virtually everything has lived up to expectations. The only car I think that missed the mark for me was the 128Ti. That's a bit of a strange concoction of calibrations that we thought was a natural rival for the Volkswagen Golf GTI, but having driven it on the road, for me, it just doesn't quite hit the mark. The biggest strength of the BMW 128Ti is the fact that it brings BMW's expertise and knowledge when it comes to interior, fit, finish, and ergonomics. You're sat nice and low, the wheel has the perfect thickness, all the controls are very understandable, the cabin is beautifully finished. It is a nice place to spend time. Perhaps its biggest weakness is that it doesn't seem to enjoy driving as much as we do. It must be said that if you own that car and maybe you're not the most serious driver, you would love it. It does a lot of things right as a pedestrian road car. I've long believed that body roll is not actually the evil that many car engineers might think it is. In the MX-5 is the perfect example of how the way that that car moves on the road brings this great level of involvement for the driver as you feel the weight move back and forward and side to side. It's just a completely engaging, thrilling car to be in at any speed. It's got heaps more mechanical grip thanks to the upgraded tyres, it brakes better, but you're not losing any of that sort of MX-5 friendliness that you come to expect. It's not so harsh on the road, it's perfectly livable, and it still delivers that soft and friendly, gentle rolling and pitching and diving. The gear shift was, you know, the best. Just awesome gear shift. As a driver, you feel engaged with what's going on around you. You feel like you're controlling everything through either the throttle, brakes or steering. And when you go back to the basics of driving, that's how it should be. It's impressive that the Skoda can do what it can do while also being so practical to use every day. If you were a family and you needed one car to do all your duties with your kids, with your dog, but you also wanted to enjoy the thrill of performance driving, the Skoda is the best car for that that we've experienced in this field. Just the sheer bandwidth in the suspension in that car, it can be very, very comfortable and it can be relatively firm. It just delivers a different recipe and I think it fully deserves to be here, but it requires judging in a very specific way, looking at that car in its intended purpose and not judging it purely, purely, purely on its limit handling. Essentially, it's a golf wagon, previous generation or outgoing generation. It's a golf GTI wagon that's cheaper, that's packaged really intelligently, is well optioned and really easy to live with. As an ownership proposition, that is a really underrated car. More people should be buying skaters. It's that perfect blend of family practicality meets performance. It's not a true performance car as such, but it's got those performance elements that you want with the practicality of being a, a great family car in the wagon. The Focus ST is perhaps a little bit underrated, but that is a shame because that car is absolutely fantastic to drive on road. It's got this great rotation and it's the perfect definition of a front drive hatch. The way that it behaves and the way that it delivers all of its dynamic payoffs at such relatively low speeds is really impressive. I think a lot of people were left stunned by that car. It just surprised the hell out of me. No hype, but genuine competence. Whoever says that front wheel drive cars can't be fun and playful needs to drive that car because it rotates wonderfully into the entry of a corner and then you can just get into the gear and it has this large 2.3 litre engine with so much torque and it just pulls you out. It does so many things so right at such a great price point. It's as fun to drive slowly as it is to throw down a road and there's not too many hot hatches that you can say that about. It's a mighty thing and it's one of those ones that just come from the middle of the field right to the fore, maybe a little bit unexpectedly. I think the other big surprise was the Mustang. It's the extra grip that it's got at the front end and the tyres that it's on. It was surprising how much fun it was on that road, even though it was tight and twisty. Mac 1 Mustang. Look, this car, it's all about the engine. It's massive amounts of power, massive amounts of torque, massive amounts of fun. The sound and everything like that, it really does as a driver. It, it makes you want to drive the car. This is the best Mustang that you can buy in Australia, bar none. 
and the 700 people that have bought one have made a fantastic choice in that. This is a great grand touring car with some sports car ability. It isn't an out and out sports car as it may initially seem. This is a car more about taking the long way home and enjoying that drive as best as possible. I really like the challenge of driving the Mustang, which is a powerful rear wheel drive manual car on that route. But it's not one of those cars that you pick up by the scruff of the neck, drive it at 100% anywhere. It's, it's a muscle car and it, it just delivers what people want from a muscle car. It rocks at idle, you get that great torque reaction in it. The V8 sounds fantastic. It just ticks so many boxes as to its intended purpose. And I think it does that really, really cleverly. About that track I mentioned earlier. As Sports Car of the Year, we do have a racing circuit at our disposal. And this year, it just happens to be the finest permanent racetrack in Australia. At the Phillip Island Grand Prix circuit, the judges have an opportunity to test the very limits of each car in a controlled environment. Phillip Island is a daunting track, but it's also exciting. It is Australia's fastest permanent racetrack, and it's gonna be the place where these cars get to go faster than they probably will at any other point, both in our possession and maybe even in their future lives elsewhere in the road. That is a circuit that demands respect. It is a circuit that will challenge us and it will challenge the cars, and it's gonna be a fantastic time being able to experience all of those vehicles on that racetrack. There's no other track like Phillip Island and of course the scenery is stunning and it's deceptively technical. It can look fairly straightforward on a map but again with the sheer speeds you're carrying a lot of those corners are not as open as they appear. What a fantastic environment to test those cars. There's no hiding when you're on a racetrack. Clearly shows the depth of capability for the best cars and you know that's a cliche but the cream rises to the top. The track changed my opinion on the Golf. The ceiling on that car is a lot higher than it might initially present itself to you. The Golf GDI, it's a beautiful car. It's fun, it's comfortable, it doesn't do anything wrong, but when you think of Golf GDI, you are always thought of that playful hot hatch. It's graduated beyond that now, and it's kind of sad to see it move on, but still a beautiful car. The Mustang again um, was very good on track, which was surprising. Gave you confidence in both front and rear axle. That was a really, really impressive car on track. It'll turn into a corner and just grip, and then the sound effects when you jump onto the gas are just beautiful. It's a car that rewards a certain knowledge and expertise. The turn in from that car was just fantastic does everything right from a muscle car perspective. They've fixed all of the things that, that needed to be fixed and you've got this really nice harmonious package now. The other one was the Octavia. On the fast flowing sections of Phillip Island, the longer wheelbase with the Octavia, it just kind of worked and it was actually quite quick. The Skoda was shockingly good on track. You compare that car against its intended use and it's a practical family car with sporty intentions. But that was a genuinely quick car at the track. The BMW 128 Ti somewhat redeemed itself on track because Phillip Island has such a beautifully smooth surface. You didn't have that nervous front end and that over damped sort of pattering that you got on the poorly surfaced road route. For me, this car was a lot more fun out here on the circuit than what it was on the road. Its starring elements are definitely the engine and gearbox. You can actually hear and feel what the car is doing through the driver inputs. I was really super impressed by the Focus ST. I was looking for a chink in the armour and I never found one. And if you're ever going to find one, it's going to be on the track and it's especially going to be at Phillip Island. The Full Focus ST is a car that has hidden its light under a bushel a little bit because there's no RS version of this generation. I think people patronised the ST a little bit and looked at it as, you know, something that wasn't full effort from Ford. But it's a really, really good hot hatch and it's as powerful as you reasonably need a front wheel drive hot hatch to be. And the engine just has bags of character, that 2.3 is just a torque monster and it's like driving this you know, like a baby muscle car of a hot hatch. 
The BRZ, it's like when you drive that car, there's a party going on inside it. The engine's going off, the chassis's giving you Porsche type feedback, grips from the front, so it turns you into the corner, grips from the back, if you really want to hang the tail out, you can. That car, most improved, definitely. I think for anyone who's wanting a track car that's affordable, definitely be looking at the BRZ because they're pretty unbreakable. And for learning your craft as well, with the pedal boxes well set up for heel and toe. It's a sweet thing. The steering is so good. The tractability of the engine is so much better. It just gives you so many more options in the old car. Perhaps the biggest compliment I can give the Hyundai i20N is it feels like the 911 GT3 of micro hot hatches. It has such confidence in the way that it deploys its power that it never feels out of its depth on track. This thing is a great little hot hatch. It's so playful with the front end of the car. This circuit probably doesn't really do it justice. It runs out of puff a little bit, but certainly in the tighter corners, it's so much fun with the front end of the car. You can make it do exactly what you want. It's got so much grip, which gives you confidence, but you just want it to be that little bit looser in the rear to take that fun to that next level. I'm not a great MX-5 fan, but what a great little car to be driving on the track. Just gave a lot of feedback, a lot of good fun, was on the track the whole time without hiccups. Brakes lasted even. The MX-5 isn't going to set a lap record leaderboard alight, but you're gonna get out of that having a life-affirming experience on track. For me, the MX-5 is real proof that you don't need a Nürburgring tuned chassis. You don't need massive horsepower and you don't need a specifically developed tire just for that particular car. It gives you really good feedback as well, but also because it doesn't have a lot of power, it also makes you refine and finesse your driving because any mistake, especially coming onto the longer straights here at Phillip Island, really costs you an overall lap time. The i30N sedan is here for one purpose, and that is to go fast and make you feel good doing it. It's very tied down, it's very compliant, it's very confidence inspiring when you're behind the wheel. It just has a really great front end. You can turn in and it will stick with the LSD as well. It will power out. So the days of people thinking that front wheel drive cars can't be fun or can't be fast is very much not true now, with, especially with this car. The Toyota GR has so much mechanical competence that it's just super impressive. The gearbox is great, the engine is great, the diffs are great. It has certainly rectified all the issues we found with the non-rally version. I think it is a very worthy redemption arc. It truly does feel like a different car. It all comes together to deliver a car that will turn in with urgency. That's the Yaris we always wanted. And yeah, it delivers on that, absolutely. Performance data is core to the judging criteria, and the acceleration and braking performance of each car is measured and compared with the manufacturer's claims. Using the same stretch of tarmac provides a true level playing field. Despite having the smallest engine in our field, the Yaris destroyed the 0 to 100 opposition with its rally style launch control combined with grippy all wheel drive and light weight. With its muscle car power, the Mark 1 dominated in the 0 to 400 meter dash and was the only car of the pack to pass 180 at the line. The judges are pretty handy at the wheel, but they can't pedal a car quite like our resident race ace Luffy, who is handed the keys for another important part of the assessment. A hot lap in each contender provides a consistent measure of the model's outright performance ability and can throw up some surprising results. Lap times are not the deciding factor, but instead add to the body of information used to evaluate each car. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Mustang's monster engine gave it the long legs that suit the fast Phillip Island so well. And it came in at the top of the pack. In terms of driving experience, this thing is unbelievable on, on track. It kind of defies belief that a car of this size with that big an engine over the front can be so good on the way into the corner, mid corner, rotation. It just does everything so well. Engine's fantastic, plenty of power, lots of torque. The gear shift is probably the thing that lets it down a little bit. It's a little bit notchy, sort of, especially when you're going back down the gears and then on the second to third up change, you feel like it's costing you sort of a bit of time. But definitely a car that puts a smile on your face and definitely a car you want to keep driving.
Toyota Yaris, 151.2. This thing was actually so much fun to drive on the limit. Initially, I was a little bit worried about what its high speed stability was gonna be like. Obviously, very short wheelbase. You traditionally would think that it's gonna be quite nervous at high speed, but it really was at home through the high speed corners. But where it really came into its own was low speed, like into the hairpin, you trail the brake in. It doesn't unsettle the rear, but you can feel it load the nose really nicely and really point it. Hyundai i30N, look, this car's really fast. There's no two ways about that, but it's probably not as engaging from a driving perspective. It feels just like you're a little bit disconnected from it in, in some areas. The Skoda raised a few eyebrows, laying down a respectable time despite its compelling practical features and proving a wagon can be potent as well as sensible. Subaru's BRZ was about the middle of the fastest lap times, but its likeable nature on track made its keys among the hardest to pry out of the judges' hands. This car is so much fun out there. It's all driver focused, there's nothing artificial. After a week of gruelling testing and deliberation, the judges are ready to crown a winner and the 2022 Sports Car of the Year. In 10th place, BMW's Golf GTI rival didn't quite live up to high expectations, and although it did redeem itself somewhat on track, it wasn't enough among some seriously strong competition. Skoda's multi-talented Octavia RS is still proving that a practical, affordable wagon can be fun and athletic, whether it's on the road or track. But it had to bow in 9th place to some more youthful competition. Even after eight generations, the venerable Golf GTI is still punching hard as a hatchback that can blend into the background during the working week, but shine on the weekend. In eighth place, it's still one of the greats. Finishing seventh overall, Ford's mightiest Atmo Mustang is the sharpest to come to Australia and is a huge amount of muscle for the cash. But it's a relatively blunt tool when compared to some of its company here. Dressed up in performance-boosting rally bits, the GI Yaris has taken a leap ahead of the 2021 version, although the extra ability comes at a significant price. It finished up sixth. With polar opposite approaches to performance and fun, but delivering both in equal measures, it was impossible to split the pack in fourth and fifth place, and the i30N and MX-5 ranked equal. Third place for Sports Car of the Year this year is the Hyundai i20N and it was the pre-event favourite with reason and we were really impressed with this little Korean hot hatch but there were some elements about the car that didn't quite thrill the judges as much as others and needed a little bit of improving. As a first try the i20N is outstanding and this is a car that Hyundai should be really proud of. The Hyundai i20N delivered a really, really strong all-round performance. And the fact that it's in third place isn't due to any particular deficit with that car. It's just that it came up against two stronger rivals. And that's it. Hyundai shouldn't feel that third place is somehow a slight fail or anything like that because the i20N is a cracker. We really loved it and we could heartily recommend that. If you're looking for a budget hot hatch, the i20N, just go and drive one. Find a really great piece of road, go and drive it. Second place for Sports Car of the Year is the Ford Focus ST and it was the ultimate front drive hatch in this field, which is saying something when it's against two hyped up, Hyundai's and the class benchmark for ever, the Golf GTI. The Focus is engaging in surprising ways, has a depth of capability that has layers to it that you can really delve into, and a capability on track that never gets boring. The Full Focus ST can best be summarised in one word, fun. And that's something that a lot of manufacturers forget to build into their cars because fun is sometimes a hard sell for them. But the great thing about the ST is that Ford has engineered a car that has this really, really playful side, and it's just so endearing. And that's why we're here, isn't it? The joy of driving. And 
the Focus ST delivers that absolutely in spades. The winner of Sports Car of the Year 2022 is the Subaru BRZ. It is accessible, it is brilliant. This is a car that all enthusiasts can enjoy. Whether you own supercars, whether you're looking for your first car, the BRZ is going to be an enjoyable driving experience. It has this engine that wants to be revved, that you can work hard, it has a chassis with fantastic balance, it has tyres that can be pushed. There is so much to enjoy about this car, and it's a car that defines what makes driving so much fun. The Subaru BRZ barely put a foot wrong. There were a number of shortcomings of the previous generation car that were very, very easy to identify. And Subaru have forensically eliminated pretty much all of them. And the result is a car that just sends keen drivers into raptures. You can do what you want with that car. You can slide it around, you can drive it in a really disciplined, tidy manner and it's always there for you. It's just so much fun. And again, we come back to fun, joy of driving, simplicity, purity of response, all of the good stuff. The BRZ delivers. <laughs>